please allow me to now introduce our speakers for today's session. Dr. Janet Thomas, Professor, Department of Pediatrics, Clinical Genetics and Metabolism with Children's Hospital Colorado. And Erica Wright, Senior Instructor, Certified Genetic Counselor with the Department of Pediatrics, Clinical Genetics and Metabolism with Children's Hospital Colorado. Thank you all again for joining us today. Now let's begin. Hi all, it's so great that you were able to take time out during your lunch time to be with Dr. Thomas and I. So one of the things we'll be doing today is talking about the basics of newborn screening as well as talking about inborn errors in metabolism and discussing some cases that have occurred over the years with our experiences with newborn screening for these disorders. First and foremost, we just want to let you know of a few disclosures. Uh, Dr. Thomas is currently serving as the co-program director for Mountain States Regional Genetics Network, which is a HRSA-sponsored grant, and she receives part of her salary for this grant, and I currently have no disclosures to report. So just also to let you know that this is going to be part of a five-part series occurring the second Tuesday of the month. As we talked about today, we'll cover part of the disorders, but we will continue next month with hemoglobinopathies and endocrine disorders. Then we'll continue on through cystic fibrosis and SCID. We're very excited about um, November to talk about spinal muscular dystrophy. And last but very not least is going to be discussing point of care screening. So we hope that you will be able to join us for many of these presentations. And so today we'll review the evolution of newborn screening talk about some of the logistics that I know many of you are familiar with. We'll talk about inborn errors of metabolism as a whole, particularly related to those that are on our Colorado, Wyoming newborn screening panels. Talk about the follow-up process, as well as again, talk about the cases that will highlight both the successes of our program, as well as shortcomings of newborn screening. And so the goal of newborn screening always is a great way to start off a presentation. So. The goal of newborn screening is to identify babies affected with treatable conditions before damage occurs. And it really all started with PKU. And to think about that, we have to go back to 1930s, where a family known as the Anglin family was dealing with having two children, Liv and Dag, that both had significant intellectual disabilities and very destructive behavior. Mom had noted that their urine was quite foul smelling and she was living in Norway at the time and able to connect with a Dr. Foling to talk more about what was going on with her children. So that's really where we get the start of newborn screening with the discovery of what Dr. Foling was able to identify as phenyl ketonuria after noting again that he was able to run tests on these two children's urine and find phenyl pyruvic acid in both urine samples and reach out to colleagues around the area and identify additional individuals, what he described as PKU. However, it took almost 20 years later before we fully were understanding the biochemistry of PKU and Dr. Bickle was able to initiate a diet for a patient with PKU where he removed all phenylalanine from that patient's diet and showed that that toddler was actually able to make some developmental progress. He then actually fully added back in phenylalanine to that patient's diet and showed the regression again. A few years later was our first attempt at developing a screening test for PKU. Dr. William Centerwall developed a test where he was able to apply ferric chloride solution to a wet di diaper and identify in urine elevations of phenyl urine. Uh, Alanine. The diaper test was done, however, though, at one to two months of age and was really done in pediatrician offices, so was nowhere near a screening at that point. Dr. Guthrie, who all of us who work in newborn screen will always think of as the grandfather of newborn screening, developed a few things for us. He developed the bacterial innovation assay to detect elevated phenylalanines. He also developed the concept of dried blood spots that could be sent on filter paper to regional labs, such as a public health department lab. And what we knew at that time with PKU and what we've learned over the years is that without newborn screening, these individuals have significant intellectual disability, seizures, autistic-like behavior, a mousy odor, as well as they have hypopigmentation. However, with treatment, we know that these individuals have normal growth and normal development. 
And so in having a treatment that had been proven and a technique that had been developed, Massachusetts was the first state to launch newborn screening for PKU in 1963. Very quickly thereafter, many states also developed newborn screening. It began actually in Colorado in 1965. However, even by the end of the 60s, many states were already doing newborn screening. In 1979, federal funding became available, which really helped, again, establish newborn screening programs across the nation. Supporters at the time included March of Dimes, as well as what we now know as ARC. This is a familiar picture for us who work in newborn um, screening, and the fact that this de picture depicts two siblings that show what the drastic developmental changes that can occur with institution of a diet early on. Newborn screening for PKU was such a success that it led to the expansion of newborn screening and the development of many other methodologies over the years. And so, in order to determine which disorders were suitable for newborn screening, for many years we looked to the World Health Organization's criteria that was developed by Wilson and Junger. This really defined what needed to happen in order for a disorder to be considered for newborn screening. The disorder had to be relatively well defined. It had to have a frequency where you'd be able to identify individuals during an asymptomatic stage. And of course, it had to have some type of measurable substance that could be detected. The disorder had to have significant morbidity and mortality. There had to be a success successful treatment that was available. There had to be a cost effective screening test that showed adequate sensitivity and specificity had to be valid, reliable, most importantly for public health and affordability, it had to be relatively quick and cheap. There had to be facilities that were available for diagnosis and treatment. And in the past, during the evolution of newborn screening, initially we saw that each disorder added to the panel required a separate test. However, back in the early 2000s, we began the process of multiplexing, where with just one test, we were able to look at multiple disorders at the same time. However, it's always been standard in the United States that each state decides its own newborn screening panel. And when we think of newborn screening, it's just a good reminder to talk about the fact that this is more than just a test, that it's actually a system. And a good way to think about that system is to review the 11 T's of screening. Technology, training, personnel, taking the sample or specimen collection, transportation of those specimens, the actual testing that occurs at the laboratories, the reporting of those results or telling, tracking what we consider to be short-term follow-up of confirming those results and determining the false positive rate, teaching of those individuals that are involved in the process, of course the treatment part of it, tracking what we know as long-term follow-up to ensure that these individuals have good outcomes three, five, 10, 20 years out, or totaling it all up of what the cost of such a system on. And so, with many changes happening over the last two decades of newborn screening, we got to a point in the early 2000s where there were states that were, um, had implemented many different disorders for newborn screening and others that really were just doing a few disorders. We also had a variability at that point regarding the technology and the timeliness. And so, one of the ways that this was brought to be unified was really during some efforts of federal standardization. The Advisory Committee on Her Heritable Disorders in Newborn and Children was formed in 2003, and this was formed after the passage of the federal legislation that is known as the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act. And part of that committee's tasks was to develop a decision matrix for newborn screening expansion. And they developed what we know as the RUSP, the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, which is a lengthy ev evidence-based process in order to evaluate different disorders to determine whether or not they should be recommended at the federal level. And this is just a recommendation to guide states. Those recommendations, after they make it their way through this lengthy process, are then um, voted on by the advisory committee and then sent on to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And even when a disorder makes its way through that process and is voted that it should be included on the RUSP, it does not mean that that disorder will be implemented at the state level or that there will be funding from the uh, federal level to implement those disorders. It is just, again, a recommendation. 
So since 2005, when this recommended uniform screening panel process was developed, there's been a handful of disorders that have made their way through that process. SCID was the first one that has passed, and um, the last state to initiate SCID was done about a year to two years ago. So um, the other disorders are the critical congenital heart defect, Pompeii, MPS1, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, and then spinal muscular atrophy, which was the last disorder just added. There are many disorders, though, that have been brought to the committee that have been then um, have not made their way fully through the process or eventually were voted no in that committee process. And so a little bit about the basics. Um, I know these are very common for many of you. The first newborn screen is done by that heel prick, and it's typically performed between 24 to 48 hours at the birthing facility or the home birth. That specimen, of course, is collected on the dried filter paper. It is allowed to dry. And then the goal now um, is really for that specimen to be sent either via courier or overnight delivery to a state public health department. Here in Colorado is with our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Or some states that are maybe smaller states might utilize a commercial laboratory or possibly utilize another state laboratory like we do in Wyoming because of the birth prevalence not being high enough to allow for a smaller state to really make it financially feasible to have their own library uh, laboratory. Some states, particularly out here in the West, have mandated a second newborn screen. I believe last check there are 10 states that have a mandated second screen. The goal is always to collect that specimen prior to any type of treatment for that inner individual baby that might affect the results. So prior to things like transfusion, dialysis, or antibiotics. There sometimes are different cutoffs in different state systems for premature infants, because we know that historically premature infants have been a bit of a barrier for many state health departments to order with a higher rate of false positives. Once that specimen is received by that public health laboratory, it is run for over 30 disorders, typically within a 24 to 48 hour period. The abnormal results are then reported out to the, either the PCP or possibly contracted specialists. And of course, the other thing to point out is that in addition to that dried blood spot being collected at, uh, at all the birthing facilities, there is also point of care screening, which includes both hearing and critical congenital heart disease. Although these are done at the birthing facility or in the home birth setting, the outcomes are often tracked by public health departments. One of the barriers that comes up continually is that in order for newborn screening uh, to occur correctly, we need to have an appropriate sample. Unsatisfactory specimens occur um, across the board around the nation. Our state here has about a 1% rate of unsatisfactory specimens. There's a number of reasons that can result in an unsatisfactory unsatis specimen. Some of the more common ones that we see is incomplete saturation, which you could see in that upper left-hand picture, where it might look completely appropriate on the top of the card, but when you flip over the card, you see that the blood has, there's not adequate blood that has saturated this. We also see insufficient quantity, which you could see in that middle picture with all those small little drops of blood. Often you could see blood that has been contaminated. Possibly it was laid um, on a workspace where there was an alcohol swab and the blood has now kind of traveled across that card. We also see specimens that have not dried correctly and that they were quickly put um, in their sleeve and have now wind up with blood all over. And of course, we sometimes see clotting where you see that big, rather ugly looking clot on that dried spot. Again, um, the goal is to get as many of these specimens um, collected appropriately so that we can, again, get those results called out in a timely manner. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thomas as she reviews the inborn errors of metabolism that are currently screened for in our state. Good afternoon, everyone, and again, thanks for joining us. It's exciting for us to be able to present this information to you all, and hopefully um, the goal, of course, is to learn something along the way, so we hope that is the case. I'm going to touch on the inborn errors of metabolism that are frequently diagnosed on newborn screening now, um, and we'll kind of go through those sort of quickly here. So the first um, couple to discuss are both galactosemia and biotinidase. Those two stand out a little bit for us from the standpoint that if you um, 
anticipate and talk about newborn screening via tandem mass spec, these two disorders are not picked up on tandem mass spec. So these two disorders require a different technique in the laboratory in order to continue to diagnose them. Um, and certainly all of us continue to support that. So galactosemia <clears throat> is a condition where you're unable to metabolize galactose and lactose, and it results um, in accumulating toxic byproducts that have long-term effects on the infant. Um, specifically in the neonatal period, we see liver failure and sepsis. More um, long-term, we see things like cataracts, speech issues, de uh, mild developmental delay, ovarian failure. And re this disorder requires a lifelong restriction of galactose and lactose. So this, these kids are on a metabolic uh, diet, if you will, but one of our quote unquote easier diets in that many of these products can now be found in the grocery store. Galactosemia, however, is one of what we would call a time critical diagnosis as these kids can get quite sick. So it used to be described that galactosemia is a true metabolic emergency and probably remains so. Um, the hope is that we get these kiddos switched to soy formulas relatively quickly before they have a chance to get too sick. Biotinidase deficiency is sort of a little bit in the opposite in that this is the disorder we somewhat describe as um, if you were to have an inborn air metabolism, this one might be the one to have in that it's relatively easy to treat. These kids do not typically present in the first couple weeks of life, but actually present a little bit later. Um, the deficiency is such that you're unable to utilize biotin and to recycle biotin, which is essential for metabolizing proteins and carbohydrates. Um, and subsequently, the treatment is actually to just provide some additional free biotin supplementation. Untreated, these kids have seizures, uh, terrible developmental uh, disability, alopecia, and eczema, but with treatment, they do well and look like normal, typical children with normal growth and development, as long as they stay on their biotin for their lifetime. The next group of uh, inborn errors and metabolisms that we'll touch on is the amino acidopathies. And I think from here on out, the, the way I like to kind of remind people what sort of disorders are picked up on newborn screening via tandem mass spec is to think about that this, this uh, technology really gives you essentially a set of amino acids and gives you an acyl carnitine profile. So the disorders that you'd pick up with acyl carnitine profile or um, an amino acid panel is sort of the disorders you pick up on newborn screening. Those are the amino acidopathies, the organic acidemias, the fatty acid oxidation defects, um, and then a few other odd ones thrown in. So the amino acidopathies on the newborn screen, we see and what gets reported to um, on the reports are your specific values of these metabolites. So for PKU, it's phenylalanine, tyrosine for tyrosinemia, methionine for homocystinuria, leucine for MSUD, and then we also, as a an additional tier of testing in the newborn screen lab, do succinylacetone. So these um, all disorders in the amino acidopathies, of course, result from enzyme deficiencies within these specific pathways. Most of the amino acidopathies also do not have a classic acute presentation in the newborn period. So you have a little bit of time here, and a lot of times on newborn screening, we don't get called out with the first abnormal newborn screen. We might get called with the second abnormal screen. Um, there is some variation for each of these in that kind of rule. So PKU, we get called out for the first screen. This is resulting from an elevation of phenylalanine. And the easiest way to think of it is that phenylalanine is toxic to the brain. There's more to it than that, but that's the, probably the easiest way. And so this is primarily untreated, a brain disease, where you get uh, intellectual disability, seizures, spasticity, et cetera. Tyrosinemia is, again, another enzyme deficiency in the tyrosine pathway, and you get buildup of tyrosine metabolites, which largely are toxic to the liver, um, but can also cause other problems. Ideally, the one most designed for newborn screening is tyrosine type 1. That's the one we most want to pick up, but it's probably the one we least likely pick up, hence the reason succinyl acetone was added to many second-tier screens um, in, in most states' systems, because succinyl acetone is very specific for tyrosinemia type 1. 
tyrosine anemia type 1 is uh, the disorder that has most toxicity to the liver. Tyrosine types 2 and type 3 are quite rare, but we also pick them up on newborn screen, and these individuals will present with developmental delay, corneal lesions, hyperkeratosis of palms and soles, etc. They get less liver disease than the tyrosinemia is type 1. Homocystinuria is the uh, disorder that we're looking for when we screen with methionine. You get elevated total homocysteine levels, which affects the brain, giving seizures and intellectual disability. It affects the eyes, giving lens dislocations, bones, giving a tall morphinoid habitus, and clotting, which results in strokes and pulmonary embolism and is the main problem with uh, morbidity and mortality for homocystinuria. And then finally, leucine um, picks up maple syrup urine disease, or MSUD. This is a defect of branch chain uh, amino acid metabolism. These babies, unlike the other amino acid opties, will get sick in the first weeks of life. These kids sort of look more like the organic acidemia kids, if you will. And uh, these kids can be quite sick by the time that this, uh, this is picked up. Uh, these kids have a lot of um, uh, developmental delays and um, have intermittent metabolic decompensations, as you would see with the organic acidemias, um, and requires a, a very strict leucine-restricted diet. The treatment of amino acidopathies, as we've touched on, most of these require metabolic diet with the appropriate amino acid restriction and or supplementation. Um, we do now have some medications, so it's not all diet. So for PKU, we have two medications, Kuvan, which is uh, tetrahydrobiopterin, which is the cofactor for the enzyme that's been available now for over 10 years. And more newly available is Palenzeq, which is an enzyme substitution therapy that got approved last May after quite long clinical trials. Tyrosinemia type 1 um, is now uh, very frequently and almost always treated with NTBC, um, which provides an alternate pathway for tyrosine and helps break down those metabolites before they can cause the liver disease. And then homocystinuria, we use betaine or cystidine, which provides a pathway for homocysteine back to methionine. Thus, it reduces the total homocysteine levels, but raises methionine levels. But to be quite honest, we're less concerned about elevated methionine levels than we are about elevated homocysteine levels. And finally, for some of these disorders, particularly tyrosinemia type 1, we do liver transplantation. Urea cycle disorders, I think, are a little bit of a caveat for this group in that these um, we primarily pick up citrulline and arginine. We do not pick up all urea cycle disorders on newborn screening. And in fact, we don't pick up the most common urea cycle disorder, that being uh, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. So the urea cycle functions for two things. Largely, it helps excrete waste nitrogen from the breakdown of protein. Um, and it helps us make arginine, and arginine then is used in other pathways. So it is the main source of ammonia detoxification. And consequently, a block in the urea cycle typically results in very elevated ammonia levels. Um, and as we all know, ammonia also is toxic to the brain. And the goal with therapy for these disorders is to bring ammonia levels down to normal sort of as quickly and as soon as possible. Uh, urea cycle disorders can present at any age, most commonly in infancy. And these babies typically look healthy for the first 24, 48 hours and then develop poor feeding, vomiting, lethargy, irritability, and hyperventilation. I would point out that babies have a very small repertoire of what they can do in the newborn period as far as a consequence of getting ill. So these babies, along with the, urea, uh, the organic acidemia babies, as well as the babies um, with sepsis all sort of look the same. The babies basically will stop eating, vomit, become lethargic, um, and comatose. So these sorts of disorders can pro progress rapidly to apnea, coma, and death if someone doesn't consider um, checking an ammonia level. Um, for the urea cycle disorders in particular, most of the other standard labs, such as count metabolic or basic metabolic, are very normal, and unless you check an ammonia level, this, these are disorders that can be missed, and these babies may die with the erroneous diagnosis of sepsis, for example. So um, um, if you have concerns about these babies, please check an ammonia level. Again, not all urea cycle disorders are picked up on newborn screening. Uh, these are also um, typically kind of um, uh, metabolic emergencies, if you will, particularly if the ammonia is sky high. 
So initially, these babies present often quite sick. We stop all protein intake, and ideally, we promote anabolism by giving lots of calories. That means a lot of IV fluids and interlipids to promote it, that anabolism. We have a variety of drugs that we can use. We call them ammonia scavenging drugs that help remove ammonia, sort of a chemical dialysis, if you will. And if the ammonia is not coming down kind of precipitously as we'd like to see it, these children get dialyzed to bring that ammonia down, again, sort of as quickly as possible. Long term, these kids are on a true protein-restricted diet, and I say that because I, I would classify the other diets that we see as more specific amino acid um, restricted diets rather than a true protein-restricted diet. And then we supplement here with uh, essential amino acid mixtures to make sure the kids are getting enough protein and all the essential amino acids. Again, we want to prevent catabolism long-term during times of illness and fasting. So there's prompt intervention during illness. And frequently, these kids are hospitalized with high ammonia levels during intercurrent illness. Long-term, they stay on their ammonia scavenging drugs. And if caught early, these disorders are amenable to liver transplantation. Switching gears to the organic acidemias, these tend to be fairly commonly diagnosed, probably more so now than what we even previously thought. On the newborn screen, we're looking for the metabolites C3, C5, C5DC, and C5-hydroxy. Those screen for such things as C3 picks up your classic organic acidemias, like methylmalonic and propionic. C5 is for isovaleric acidemia, and then C5DC is for glutaric acidemia, and C5-hydroxy is for 3-MCC, or 3 methyl coa carboxylase deficiency, hence why we say 3-MCC. Uh, interestingly, 3-MCC um, is probably the most common of that group that gets picked up, um, but we do think 3-MCC is relatively mild. Prior to expanded newborn screening, uh, I've been in clinic now for 20 years. We didn't have any kids with 3-MCC in clinic, and now we have a whole bunch thanks to newborn screening. And so it sort of tells us just in retrospect that those kids probably have milder disease um, than our more classic organic acidemias. So these are uh, enzyme deficiencies in intermediary metabolism of amino acids, and they typically result in an accumulation of your classic um, organic acids being excreted in the urine. Um, these can present at any age. Again, the ones picked up and what we're most concerned with are the severe neonatal onset form. They have a very similar presentation to the urea cycle disorders that we discussed, again, because babies have a fairly small repertoire response to illness. Um, but in uh, difference to the urea cycle disorders, these kids have abnormalities in your classic laboratory studies. So, for example, they um, get quite acidotic they get ketonuria. They can also be hyperaminemic, often not to the same degree as a urea cycle disorder kiddos, and they can get bone marrow suppression such that you can see anemia, thrombocytopenia, pancytopenia. Um, so typically, to try to, before you had your results of your newborn screen, if you had a child that presented quite sick, you could look at your comp metabolic panel, um, look at urine ketones, and really have a very good idea of what category these kiddos fell into before the newborn screen returned. Um, there's an also a chronic intermittent late onset form. This is sort of a, a bucket category. People will say this is greater than a year of age. Some people would say even um, greater than a couple months of age would fall into the late onset form. These kids may look um, generally healthy and do well in between illnesses, but these are sort of the kids that get more sick than anticipated with intercurrent illness or fasting. Um, kids may also present with GI symptoms such as um, reflux symptoms, failure to thrive. Um, they may have some subtle neurologic findings, so it has a variety of presentations in that late onset group. Initial treatment for the organic acidemias is similar to what we saw in um, the urea cycle disorders. Of course, we stop protein intake. We promote anabolism. Um, we also utilize ammonia scavenging drugs if necessary and dialysis as well if necessary. Over the long term, same sorts of um, uh, interventions in that we have specific metabolic diets for these individuals. 
Um, there is um, some vitamin supplementation we utilize because these vitamins tend to be cofactors with the within the enzymatic pathways. So for example, B12 and methylmalonic acidemia, um, biotin and multiple carboxylase deficiency. These children are on typically L-carnitine, may or may not be on glycine. L-carnitine and glycine are um, very much used in isovaleric, for example. Um, or arginine supplementation, all these, all depending on what uh, specific diagnosis you have, and then uh, liver transplantation. But I would comment that liver transplantation here is not as quote unquote un as curable as what you see in urea cycle disorders. These kids still have um, n still have a need for metabolic management and still have ongoing complications. Um, and then also long term, again, as similar to urea cycle disorders, we want to prevent. Um, Catabolism, so no fasting, um, intervention, quick intervention during illnesses, those sorts of things as well. And finally, we'll um, briefly touch on fatty acid oxidation disorders. As you see here, almost all your other metabolites that are called out on the newborn screen, C0, C4, C8, et cetera, are all um, specific markers for different fatty acid oxidations. These are enzyme deficiencies in the fatty acid oxidation pathway, um, which also includes some of the transporters into the mitochondrial membrane. The easiest way to think about the fatty acid oxidation uh, uh, group of disorders is that you turn on this pathway during times of illness or fasting. So typically, as one is fasting or as one's sick, after you use up your glucose stores, you then turn to your glycogen stores, and then subsequently you turn on this pathway to make ketones, and then the ketones can continue to fuel your heart and your liver and your muscle till the next time that you have glucose and or glycogen available. Um, so uh, when you have defects in these particular pathways, from the standpoint of liver involvement, you have limited ketone production. These are not non-ketotic uh, hypoglycemia. These are hypoketotic, so less ketones than anticipated for the degree of illness. You also then can get uh, cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias from heart involvement, and you can get uh, rhabdomyolysis and myoglobinuria from muscle involvement. Uh, these disorders are all named by the uh, length of the fat chain that can't be broken down and where in that process uh, the mistake is or the enzyme deficiency is. So typically, the longer the chain length, the more severe disorder. There's probably um, a good caveat there, however, for the BLCAT. So you have short chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, so SCAD. That's a relatively benign disorder. Most of us feel that we perhaps shouldn't be screening for that disorder. Most common that we probably see is um, medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, or MCAD. This is a moderate uh, in severity, but very treatable once you know the diagnosis and very manageable. The long chain 3 hydroxy acyl CoA dehydrogenase, or LCHED, is more severe, has more complications. And like I said, the caveat here is very long chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, VLCAD, turns out to probably be the most common of these disorders. Again, this is one of those disorders that we didn't have very many patients in clinic prior to newborn screening, and subsequent to newborn screening, we have quite a few. Um, so there's probably a high carrier frequency of that condition. And it, it's a similar to MCAD in its treatability, although there is a severe form that has a pretty significant cardiomyopathy. Um, the milder forms like MCAD, like VLCAD, you typically only have symptoms that are triggered by illness or fasting or perhaps extreme exercise. Again, these are hypoketotic hypoglycemia is a classic presentation so that the uh, kids get hypoglycemic during times of illness or fasting. Um, it is important to note, however, that by the time you see hypoglycemia, that's a late sign in these conditions, and so you really don't ever want to get to the point where you see hypoglycemia. Um, and the key here is, of course, prevention of fasting, and if they are sick or are fasting, then you provide glucose, and then their body can utilize the glucose until the next time that they eat and ongoing. So these are kids that when they get an illness, if they're vomiting, not eating well, they come into the hospital, give them IV fluids that have glucose in it, they get over their illness, and then off they go again. That's similar to the mild BL cats as well. Uh, in the more severe phenotypes, like LCHAD or severe VLCAD or multiple acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, the MADS, 
These kiddos can have symptoms very early during the first few weeks or days of life. They also have the hypoketotic hypoglycemia, but as mentioned earlier, they can have significant cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias. They can also have multiple congenital anomalies. You also get more laboratory abnormalities, not only low glucose levels, but abnormal liver functions, elevated CKs, increased ammonia, lactase. And these individuals require diet typically low in long chain fats and supplemented with medium chain fats. So the idea there is that you bypass the block in the long chain fat metabolize, metabolism, you give them the shorter chain fat and the medium chain fat, which they can utilize um, and uh, kind of bypass the block in that in the metabolism pathway. Um, uh, we also could potentially supply, could supply ketone supplementation um, that's not as easily available, but um, maybe in the future. And once again, we prevent fasting and glucose, uh, provide glucose during illness. Um, so the follow-up of uh, abnormal results, these are now reported seven days a week from CDPHE to Children's Hospital to our clinic for the metabolic disorders. Uh, the way it usually works is and then we reach out to contact the physician of record, ideally the primary care physician, to check on the status of the infant. Um, we ask typically that the primary care physician see the child, make sure the child's eating well, there's no lethargy, vomiting, you know, in some cases, for example, galactosemia, make sure there's not significant jaundice, et cetera. If there's any clinical concerns, we ask that that baby gets evaluated here locally, here at Children's, or at a local emergency department as necessary. Um, and then if we're really highly suspicious, the babies get transferred here for care under our service. Um, we have a variety of follow-up laboratory studies that we recommend depending on what's exactly flagged on the newborn screening. Some of these are actually paid for by CDPHE, mostly the aminos, organics, and acylcarnitine. Um, other more specific tests sort of depends on what the first tier follow-up testing tells us. And sometimes those tests require a little bit of legwork to get the paperwork and such be done. Um, not very often, but sometimes we will say, just wait for the second newborn screen. But uh, by that point, we hope that there's consultation with um, our newborn screening coordinator, Erica, and our uh, physician in the clinic as well. So typically when um, we get a newborn screen and we're communicating with the primary care physicians, we have um, information that we fax to the primary care physician so that they know what to send and where to send it. So we do have um, a lab rec that goes with them. It also tells us and tells the lab that CDPHG will be paying for some of these follow-up specimens. Um, and this is usually readily available and, and gets done. Really, we've been pr pretty successful getting this done across the state and across Wyoming, that these samples get to where they need to go um, as necessary. Um, again, once that sort of first tier testing is done, if we have more specific testing that needs to get done, and some of these do require things like DNA analysis or enzymatic confirmation, typically then those children are seen in clinic for that sort of testing. Um, initiation of therapy, as much as possible, if it's such things as prevention of fasting, perhaps carnitine supplementation, that might get done while we're waiting for test results. But if we know that these are kids that we have relatively high suspicion or confirmed a diagnosis on, then we see them in clinic, start diet, start medications, um, implement emergency management protocols. Also in clinic, we do genetic counseling, and we refer, of course, to other resources and other subspecialties as needed. Now we're going to switch back to a couple of case presentations. Thanks for hey. So in Coming up with cases to present to you all today, I just wanted to highlight again um, some of the barriers to newborn screening as well as some of our successes. So one of the barriers that we run into after hearing Dr. Thomas present about these disorders is that some of these disorders can definitely have a severe presentation and an early presentation. And what we mean by that is that it's a bit of a race against the clock, that these kiddos sometimes are considered in the newborn screening world to be ticking time bombs, that we only have a few days to identify them from newborn screening, but in some cases they might present earlier than a time allowed um, for the newborn screening process to occur correctly. 
we use a few different words to describe those type of conditions. Metabolic emergencies, or another word that's being utilized in time is um, time critical critical disorders. And these are the organic acidemias and some of the fatty acid oxidation disorders, and as we mentioned, galactosemia. With that being said, because we are worried about kiddos presenting quite early in life, the goal for us across our state and many states is that all of the first newborn screens arrive um, via overnight courier or at least overnight kind of FedEx type shipment. States will vary on the hours of operation. We here in Colorado are able to operate our lab six days a week. And one of the things tasked by that advisory committee I had talked about previously that was talking about those recommended uniform screening disorders, they also have looked over the years at policies and practices related to timeliness in newborn screening. And in 2015, made a statement to say that any presumptive positive results for these time critical disorders should be community, communicated immediately to healthcare providers. But the goal is no later than five days of age. And so those time critical disorders are outlined here. You can see that all of them fall fall into the inborn era of metabolism group with the exception of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, one of our endocrine disorders, which you all will hear about more next month. And so here's a case um, talking about one of those time critical disorders. In this kiddo, the newborn screen was done in a timely manner. It was done at 25 hours of age, which happened to be a Saturday. The baby um, was born after a very uncomplicated normal vaginal delivery at 37 weeks, and the baby was discharged from the hospital at day of life two and was um, solely being breastfed. That newborn screen was, um, was sent by courier, but uh, because of the weekend hours and at the time we didn't have couriers established on weekends, that newborn screening um, did not arrive at the state health department until Monday, um, and it was late on Monday, and it was run Tuesday with results called out to me on Wednesday. That Wednesday morning, the results that came over to us here at the um, metabolic clinic, clinic were very diagnostic for MCAT deficiency, that fatty acid oxidation disorder. Um, what was happening uh, for the baby was the fact that after the baby was discharged to first time parents, the baby was not doing so great with breastfeeding. Mom's milk wasn't coming in and was really requiring a lot of stimulation to get that baby to latch on and feed, which hence made milk production not great. When the baby was seen by the PCP for their newborn visit, the baby looked relatively healthy at that point, but had some mild jaundice. Um, after the baby was seen by the PCP that day, though, the family reported that the baby was um, becoming more and more lethargic, and, and the family uh, thought that maybe it was related to the jaundice. The next day, the baby, again, was really struggling to latch on, wake up for feeds, and at that point, um, the family actually even tried to syringe feed the baby. However, later in the evening, unfortunately, that baby had stopped breathing, um, and the family attempted to initiate CPR um, and the baby was taken via ambulance to a local hospital, but unfortunately was unable to be uh, resuscitated. Unfortunately, that was on day four of life, and as I mentioned on the last slide, the results were called out on day five of life, which was um, about 12 hours after the patient had died. Um, one of the cases to talk about the flip side is a more successful case for us. So we could all think back to March um, when we were watching the news, watching the bomb cyclone roll into our city, um, into our state. Um, at the same time, there was a baby who had been born at 24, uh, had been born on, late on a Saturday night. The newborn screening got done at 24 hours of age on Sunday night and was couriered um, from the Western Slope of Colorado on that Monday. Um, the specimen was run and the results came off very early um, on Wednesday morning. And I'll say kudos to our colleagues at our state newborn screening program in looking at the weather and recognizing that we were about to be bombarded with a huge amount of snow and winds. The state had opened up earlier that day and made sure to get as many staff in as they could prior to that storm hitting so that they can go through the results. And so I knew by 7 a.m. that there was going to be a critical value being reported to me. And that, again, was for MCAT deficiency. And we were able to get those results to me um, first thing early in the morning. And we were able to then um, get things going on this baby prior to our storm hitting. Those newborn screen results showed MCAT. And so 
I was able to communicate with the PCP on call, because again, this was before eight in the morning, so the, um, the physician had not opened up the office yet. And per the PCP's office, the baby had been seen the day before and was noted to be having weight loss and really was just not a vigorous eater. Um, I don't know if we use the word lethargic, but that baby was definitely not doing great. Um, mom was a second time mom and it said feeding wasn't going well. And so she was instructed to begin supplementation with formula after each breastfeeding, again, to get that weight on that baby climbing up and not down. Um, that was actually quite reassuring to me to know that the baby had, was getting uh, supplementing feeds with breast milk until breast milk was in full demand because I knew then that the patient had adequate calories. The PCP was able to get the baby in within an hour of into the practice and the family was instructed to feed the baby at least every three hours and continue with that supplementation until mom felt that her milk was in good supply. Um, also what was happening was at the same time, we had a, a genetic counselor and a geneticist from our general genetics clinic who happened to be able to catch their flight out of um, the Denver metro area that morning and was actually on the Western Slope. They were not only able to um, communicate with the PCP, but they were able to get that patient in that morning um, for evaluation and the diagnostic labs and the genetic counseling. So amazingly enough, within a few hours of those results, we had the baby uh, connected, evaluated by the PCP, connected to care in our clinic and diagnostic testing um, being performed in order to um, identify that this kiddo did in fact have MCAD. So when we think about that newborn screening timeliness. Um, per our state rules and regulations, newborn screening uh, should be collected between 24 and 48 hours of age for all babies. That includes NICU babies. Previously, there was a recommendation in the books that NICU babies could wait up to seven days to have their newborn screening collected. However, with many of these disorders presenting within the first few days of life, we made sure that now all babies are collected. And again, for those NICU babies, it's really important to get that screen done prior to things such as a uh, blood transfusion. And really one of the goals that we've been aiming for is aiming for a collection at 24 hours of age to just get that specimen collected. That specimen then is to be dried horizontally. That helps with saturation. And um, we really recommend that that specimen is only dried for three to four hours. I know previously when I've had the chance to talk to hospitals in the community, um, there were a lot of providers or hospitals that were letting that that specimen dry up overnight. And truth be told, we live in a pretty dry climate. And so three to four hours is sufficient here. And at that point, then that specimen could be packaged and really sent on that courier. As I mentioned, couriers run six days a week. That's a service that our health department maintains. And so we've always encouraged those hospitals to know your career pickup time so that they could be watching the clock and really think a newborn screening by the hour to say, okay, if I package this specimen up now, the career will be here in an hour. That way, every specimen that's been collected at this birthing facility will make this career and will get to the state health department that day. Um, with those couriers running, we get those specimens ideally to our newborn screening lab within 24 hours. Uh, per the national guidelines, it should never be later than 72 hours after collection. Again, we're aiming for getting those specimens to the lab within 24 hours. The State Health Department currently runs eight different tests on that first uh, go around that will screen for 35 disorders. The time critical disorders will run uh, six days a week and so they will get called out typically within 24 hours. Sometimes um, for many of the things for many of the disorders, the state will just repeat it so that we will get, um, we're ensuring that it's the correct card with the correct baby. But again, that, um, that will be reported out within 48 hours. And then of course those abnormal results, particularly those time critical re results are reported to the PCP for follow-up and further consultation. And so one of the other barriers we run against is um, reminding folks in the community that this is still just a screen and that false negatives do exist and that a screen is not diagnostic. We establish cutoffs in order to capture all the affected babies but also to limit the number of false positives so we're not crying wolf too often. This picture really depicts the fact that there is overlap between those healthy babies and those babies that have the disorder. And that's really where that overlap occurs, where we struggle with where it's the best place to establish that cutoff. 
Multiple states will utilize second tier testing to reduce both the number of false positives as well as hopefully prevent false negatives. You all are familiar with um, us utilizing kind of molecular for cystic fibrosis and developing an algorithm with, again, the main goal of reducing false positives while making sure to avoid false negatives. And so with that being said, um, here's a case that happened uh, a long time ago in Colorado, pretty quickly after we had started tandem mass spectrometry. This was a baby that was brought to the emergency setting after the baby was found to be limp and lethargic in her crib that morning. Leading up to that, she had a two-day history of a fever and a respiratory infection, so your typical type of illness that strikes um, many infants out there. And she really hadn't been eating well the day before with her fever and her coughing, and she had one episode of vomiting the night before. She was then put down for bed, um, made it through the night. However, when the family went to check on her in the morning, again, she was very limp. And when the EMTs were called, the glucose at the time was a 17. When she arrived at the hospital, her COMP metabolic panel showed that she had metabolic acidosis. She also had liver dysfunction. She also had ammonia elevated, and she was not making ketones. At the time when the parents checked into the emergency room setting, they uh, let the ED staff know that as best as they knew, the newborn screen had been normal. So, but the baby had made their way here to Children's Hospital. The baby was um, in liver failure at that point. Uh, the diagnostic labs were performed and the acylcarnitine uh, confirmed the suspicion of a fatty acid oxidation, namely LCHAD deficiency. The baby was switched off of that high fat breast milk and switched over to a formula that is low in those long chains and high in those medium chain oils. And the baby's liver was able to improve quite drastically over that hospitalization. And despite having that very low blood sugar, there was no developmental concerns about that child. During that time when the baby was being transferred and we were waiting for those acylcarnitine profiles, we're able to often call our state lab and just ask, hey, could you look at this newborn screen for us? Is there anything that is maybe even close to cut off that would give us a direction to head in as we're waiting for those diagnostic labs to be performed within the next few hours? In looking at that newborn screening, the markers for LCHAD were quite close to cut off. Um, and at that point, uh, we, with many of our disorders, we'll look at two or three different markers before a call is made that it's abnormal. And in looking at that quickly, we can kind of guess at that point that that was suggestive of LCHAD. It was after that baby, though, we, we did spend some time with our health department and really reevaluate those cutoffs and went ahead and made a shift for LCHAD. Um, but even with making shifts and cutoffs over the years, we still know there's that, there's that concern that false negatives can always occur. So it's that friendly reminder that if a baby's symptomatic or there is a strong clinical suspicion of one of these screened disorders, the results of the newborn screening are not um, are insufficient to exclude the diagnosis. A diagnostic testing really needs to be performed to exclude those concerns. And so one of the last barriers we run up against is those disorders that are not included in newborn screening. When we expanded our panel back in 2006, we really spoke a lot to the community providers and let them know that now, wow, we had a great panel. We were looking at all these inborn areas of metabolism, um, but we didn't want to provide false reassurance that there are still many other metabolic disorders that are not on the panel. And that while newborn screening is a useful tool, it is only a small piece of the puzzle. And so again, just if those clinical concerns uh, arise, don't wait for those results and don't rely on the newborn screening results. And so here's a case of a baby that was born here in Colorado. Um, the baby was born to a first time mom after a very normal delivery um, or normal pregnancy. Delivery was a little rough and the baby needed some forceps uh, during that delivery. The baby really did well those first few days of life. However, um, probably the day the baby was about to be discharged, the baby was not overly as responsible, uh, responsive as she had been. She was still doing okay, holding her own and waking up for feeds. However, uh, prior to discharge, she began lip smacking and got very hypertonic, and so there was a concern of seizures. A CT scan was done, and it showed that she did have some edema, and she had some, a skull fracture which and a bleed, which they thought could be related to the forcep delivery. However, when they did labs on the baby, the baby had mild metabolic acidosis, but had an ammonia level that um, was quite high for a baby of that age. We typically typically see ammonia levels anything over 100 um, 
results in us kind of thinking what's going on. At that point, the baby was transferred here to the metabolic uh, clinic service of Two Children's Hospital for further evaluation. Even within those few hours of transport, we saw that ammonia level almost double. The metabolic team at that point got involved. Um, again, we were able to quickly check the newborn screen, which had come in, and that was completely normal. However, when looking at the biochemical studies, we were able to confirm that the baby had a urea cycle disorder. As Dr. Thomas noted, the most common urea, type, uh, urea cycle disorder, OTC, is not on the panel. The baby was treated with our typical urea cycle uh, treatments that we do with the protein-restricted diet supplementation and ammonia scavenging drug. Uh, OTC is a tough one, and it's one that the newborn screening community comes back to time and time again. It's the most common urea cycle disorder. However, what is elevated in those kiddos is not analytes that we can look for on newborn screening easily. It's also X-linked. So it's one of those disorders that in this case was, was a female, and hence why she had a relatively um, mild presentation with her ammonia levels only being 400s. X-linked can often be lethal in males if not detected early with ammonia rates being, uh, ammonia levels being quite high. Some females are symptomatic, others remain asymptomatic. Sometimes we identify them after the moms give birth to an affected son and then we often will do testing on that mom and find out that she in fact is a carrier of X-linked OTC. And so with those cases and as we wrap up, just a few points to bring home and then we'll happily take questions and hopefully have some time to have a good conversation. Newborn screening continues to be an integrated system. It's, it's the work of the birthing facilities and midwives, our health department newborn screening lab, the primary care providers, the specialists, those uh, biochemical and molecular laboratories that um, have to be at our beck and call on weekends when we need a stat labs done, as well as the support of the family. And of course, it's amazing tool, but as we talked about with these cases, there's still shortcomings. We know that some of these disorders will present early. We know that some disorders can be missed. We know that there's many inborn errors in metabolism that are not yet detected by newborn screening. And as we look to the future, um, and our state and our team comes together, we'll be looking at adding additional disorders, um, hopefully in the coming years. With that said, um, we hope that you enjoyed this webinar and that you can join us for next month where we will focus on the hemoglobinopathies as well as the endocrine disorders with hypothyroidism and congenital adrenal hyperplasia.